On April 15, 1935, a new type of film went on sale for the first time. It was aimed particularly at amateurs. This was part of a revolution in filmmaking, when small home movie cameras became increasingly available. As Europe descended into conflict, for the first time, ordinary people right across Britain were able to record all aspects of their lives, even at war. Nowadays, you can take it on a telephone or something or other, but it was very different then. I am conscious when I watch it that an awful lot of those guys were going to die. It seemed exciting to me. It was an exciting time to live. For the last 75 years, these extraordinary amateur films have lain undiscovered, unseen, in attics, libraries, and the vaults of film archives all over Britain. Broadcast here together for the first time, these films reveal an entirely new and uncensored personal perspective on the greatest conflict in the history of Britain. Britain in 1939. With an estimated quarter of a million ordinary people now owning a camera, there was an explosion in amateur filmmaking. In Sussex, Londoner Sidney Hansford wanted to capture his family's excitement at their new life in the country. In the garden of his home in Ashford, Victor Don, a doctor, filmed his favourite pets. While in the Garden of England, village shopkeeper Ernest Botting recorded a typical summer in Kent. Seen together for the first time, they paint a picture of a nation still seemingly at peace. But on the 7th of May, 1939, one amateur filmmaker recorded a more menacing event. A march through the streets of London by the British Union of Fascists, a party led by former Labour MP and Cabinet member Oswald Mosley. They claimed to have over 50,000 members and were able to contest local and national elections. They were also part of a much larger, more dangerous movement in continental Europe. In Germany, Hitler's Nazis had been in power for over six years. They had already transformed the country into a totalitarian fascist state. All dissent was brutally crushed, and under the new Nazi racial laws, Aryans were now viewed as the master race of the world. A new world order was on the march. But that summer in Britain, for most people, events in Europe must have felt a world away. Pharmacist Francis Newman took his family and his new camera to the beach at Westgate in Kent. Amateur filmmaker Tom Brown, a dentist from Middlesbrough, was one of the few people who could afford to holiday abroad. And he took his camera with him, recording firsthand the chilling changes on the continent. Back in the 1930s, uh, your average family would visit Blackpool or Scarborough or somewhere like that. In 1937, mother and father decided to do a tour of Europe. For over 60 years after it was made, 
Tom Brown's film was only shown to friends and relatives. This is the first time it has been publicly broadcast at length. Father was brought up in a dental family because grandfather had been the first dentist in the family. And whilst dentistry was his work, his real interest was his hobbies. Back in the 1930s, uh, it was very, very unusual to, to take movies. It was very expensive. The equipment was difficult to use and required a lot of work afterwards, much more difficult than doing video these days. So they tended to group together so they could help one another and, and advise one another. So he joined uh, the Teesside Cine Club where there were a group of similar people who were interested and also people who were interested in acting. So they were able to put on their own films. Mother wrote the script for several of the films. Father acted in them and sometimes acted as cameraman. When Tom Brown set out on his European holiday with his wife and daughter, they travelled by train and bus throughout Central Europe. They were some of the very few Britons who witnessed and filmed a continent in the last years of peace. We're talking now about the days before television. These days we see things that are going on throughout the world very, very easily. But when radio and newspaper were the only forms of communication, my parents were really quite privileged to see with their own eyes what was, what was happening in Europe and what things were heading towards. So father took the opportunity to take, make films and bring them back and show people what things were like in another country. At one point uh, in Eastern Europe, he was photographing in a railway station. He didn't know that uh, railway stations were considered part of the war effort, but he realized that somebody was running down the platform towards him uh, whilst he was standing there with his camera. Surprisingly, rather than admit defeat, he ran off down the platform, jumped into a carriage and hid under the seat. But of course, eventually he was dragged out from under the seat and to his total distress, they opened his camera and pulled reels and reels of film out of it. So he lost quite a lot of film that way. But he, he was a very adventurous person. Eventually, the Browns reached the city of Munich with its ancient Karlstor, the Charles Gate. This is the birthplace of Hitler's Nazis, where his brutal path to power had begun 14 years previously. They filmed Hitler's stormtroopers on the street. And even the anti-Semitic propaganda that marked his rise to power. My parents would have been very shocked being polite English people. I'm sure they would hope that these attitudes would go away, but of course they didn't. In fact, Hitler's grip on Europe continued to grow. In March 1938, his troops marched into a jubilant Austria, adding it to his ever-expanding Third Reich. On the 30th of September 1938, in a desperate attempt to avoid war, the leaders of Britain and France came to Munich to sign a humiliating agreement, allowing Hitler to annex parts of Czechoslovakia. Just six months later, 
Hitler tore up the agreement. But his plans to dominate Europe had only just begun. By August 1939, international tensions were reaching a peak. But Tom Brown still decided to take his family and his camera on another continental holiday. With Central Europe now in turmoil, this time the family only ventured as far as Belgium, Holland and Luxembourg. My parents would realize, of course, that things were getting heated in Europe. But at that time, nobody knew that there was going to be war, let alone when war could break out. When they arrived in Liège, Belgium, they came across an international design exhibition and filmed the delegation from Nazi Germany. Then, when they reached Belgium's border with Germany, they even saw concrete evidence of Hitler's war machine in action. They were really quite surprised to be able to film part of the Siegfried line being built uh, across the valley from where they were situated, which was Germany's defensive line in the west. And they were quite shocked to see this being built up This would draw their attention to the fact that things were progressing in Europe perhaps faster than they'd imagined. On the 1st of September 1939, while Tom Brown and his family were still in Belgium, Hitler invaded Britain's ally, Poland. Panic broke out at the local port because everybody needed to get home this would be quite a worry for them. The last frames of Tom Brown's film recorded their ferry leaving Europe for the last time as the world descended into war. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. With the fear of bombing, the government began the mass evacuation of Britain's cities. In the first three days, more than 1.5 million people were moved to safety, including over 800,000 children. Amateur filmmakers recorded this unprecedented event, and the BBC sent out radio reporters to broadcast it to the nation. The evacuation of British children is going on smoothly and efficiently. The Ministry of Health says that great progress has been made with the first part of the government's arrangements. We're on number 12 platform at Waterloo Station. Don't get uh, worried about us. We're all very happy here. And I uh, don't think anybody wants to go home yet. Official evacuation centers were set up around the country by thousands of volunteers. But just north of Lancaster, in rural Lancashire, a completely unique private school for evacuees was organized by a group of Quakers. Amateur film of it has lain unseen for over 75 years. This is the first time it has been broadcast. My father took the film. As long as he could get film, he would film most weekends. Quakers in Liverpool and Manchester got together over only a matter of a week or two and found that Yellen Manor, which was a Quaker guest house, was going to be empty during the war, so the place was 
rapidly turned into an evacuation place for the small children from Liverpool and Manchester. I was told we're off, and my father took me in the car from Liverpool in my little suitcase. I was dumped, and my father drove back to Liverpool, and that was it. I was 10, I'd just had my 10th birthday. Some of them were only sort of four or five. Now, the day after I arrived, I wrote a letter home saying that I was all right and all the rest of it. The bottom of the letter, I said, P.S. Will you tell me what is the name of the town on the postmark on this letter? Now, clearly, I was asking that question because I hadn't the faintest idea where I was. Yelland was completely different from other evacuation schools. Its organisers wanted to use it to test out new social and educational ideas. I think my mother was trying to create a stable atmosphere for children who didn't have one in a time of great trouble. She was headmistress, but she was much, much more than that. She was really a sort of mother figure to us all, and it was she who made Yelland what it, what it really was. Of course, the adults here were very protective of us. They were all very anxious and worried, and they didn't want us to be worried. The school was run on Quaker lines. The important thing about Quakers is that they believe that all people are equal. All the children here learnt to sit quietly and listen, whether it was in a meeting for worship or whether it was to listen to music or to listen to stories. And this must have had an important and calming influence on some of the children who were really quite troubled. Underlying the whole thing was this deep and very practical Christian ethos. It was a service. It was, wasn't what you could get out of it. It was what you could put into it. And this was all because of Elfrida. It was she who inspired all this. I learned how to clean the toilets, scrub floors, prepare vegetables, particularly potato peeling. That went on for hours every morning. <laughs> and we were given an education which apparently satisfied the education authorities. But I don't specifically remember the lessons, but I did do a scholarship exam. So we must have had an education but what I remember is the charging around in the woods and things like that. That's what I remember. At first, all the evacuees at Yelland came from Quaker families. But soon, any child could apply, and there was even financial help for the needy. When I see the film again, I'm impressed by the happiness that the children show. There are very few miserable children and here we were out in the country, and it's magical country, this. We had a considerable degree of freedom. The children were very free to walk in the woods when they wanted, so long as they turned up for meals. But there were children who had never been away from home before. There were children who were very anxious about the dangers of their parents living in the big cities. It affects each child differently. Over the course of the war, Yelland Manor took in 198 evacuated children. 15 of them were refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe. Hitler's anti-Semitic policies gradually expelled the Jews from society and stripped them of their rights and property, with increasing abuse, terror and violence. In late 1938, a delegation of British Jews and Quakers 
persuaded the government to allow the temporary admission of Jewish children on what was known as the children's or kinder transport. The first party of almost 200 arrived in Harwich on the 2nd of December, 1938. By the end, more than 10,000 children were rescued from the Nazis. Some of them were sent to Yelland. One or two refugee children started appearing. I remember particularly a little boy called Achim Litek, who was Polish Jew. There's a lovely bit in the film of Achim from the top of a tree, swaying to and fro. That was his idea of getting away from everything. His father was an officer in the German army and rejected his wife and Achim because they looked Jewish. But he kept their daughter because she didn't look Jewish. He spoke very little English, but he was a good mixer and we welcomed him in. And he settled in remarkably quickly. It's only looking back on it that we realize the sort of torments that must have been going on in his mind. Then I remember Renata Polga. I think she was very frightened when she arrived. She had come to a family who had a little boy and they were wanted an older sister for him. And so they had her as a foster child. They had rooms in the village and came every day to the school. We were all there to help each other, to help the underdog. We were all definitely encouraged to think for ourselves. Then we were all treated as equals, actually. Elfrida would ask us, what do you think about it? wasn't just simply telling us what she thought. Since the war, I have met one or two of the refugee children. Um, I met Achim Litek at the funeral of a woman who, with whom he, I think he lived with her straight after the war. He was exceedingly prosperous looking. I'd, <laughs> and from being a very tall, skinny young boy, he was a large, comfortable looking man wearing a very beautiful overcoat. Uh, Renata Polga went back to Czechoslovakia, which was very difficult, she said, because she had grown to call her foster parents mum and dad, and she had forgotten most of her Czech language. She had to sort of rehabilitate herself, and she stayed and took her exams and qualified as a doctor. We weren't hiding away from all the dangers. We were aware of them, but I think Yelland was teaching us how to cope with them. On the war front, in late 1939, the British Army was sent to France to support our allies. But it did little, actively, to deter Hitler's aggression. At home, there was a sense of uneasy calm as people awaited news of Hitler's next move. In Kent, pharmacist Francis Newman filmed his family as they went about their daily lives while the government propaganda machine tried to prepare the people for what lay ahead. BBC Home Service. Here is General Sir Ernest Swinton to continue the war commentary which he's giving every Thursday evening. General Swinton. Now, I told you that time was against the Germans. I think, therefore, that they are likely to try to break the existing stalemate in the West. <laughs> 
We know that they have already brought up a very large force behind the Siegfried position, with particular concentrations opposite Holland and Belgium. And now I'm going to finish on a lighter note. For though we must all keep up to scratch these days, there's no harm in extracting fun from life, even now. This phony war was finally shattered in April 1940. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is a short news bulletin. The German army invaded Holland and Belgium early this morning by land and by landings from parachutes. It was the Allies' first taste of a new type of brutal lightning warfare, Blitzkrieg. 2,500 tanks, 7,500 guns, and three million men of the German army blasted their way through the Allied defenses. Within 10 days, Holland and Belgium had fallen, and the French and British armies were in full retreat. By late May 1940, the British army was surrounded, trapped in northern France. Its only hope was evacuation by sea. Over nine days, 338,000 Allied soldiers were evacuated from the harbour and beaches of Dunkirk. Despite the restrictions of wartime censorship, the evacuation was recorded by a young naval lieutenant with his own personal camera. This unique film lay hidden in a family archive for over 70 years. It's thought to be the only amateur film of this defining moment in British history. Days and nights, ships of all kinds have plied to and fro across the channel under the fierce onslaught of the enemy's bombers and every one of them was crammed full of tired, battle-stained and blood-stained British soldiers. All of them were tired. Some were completely exhausted. But the most amazing thing was that practically every man was reasonably cheerful, and most of them managed to smile. You could still tell by his eyes that his spirit was irrepressible. And that is a thing that all the bombs in Germany will never crush. We saw Dunkirk from the sky when we had time to look ships. I'd never seen so many ships. The sea was never empty of My little crowd had five days fighting. We took off four and five times a day, and most of the fighting was over and round Dunkirk. Every time we took off, we found the Hun had a crack. We were always outnumbered, except once. On the 22nd of June, just six weeks after the fighting had begun, France surrendered to the Nazis. Now for the first time, the people of Britain faced Hitler alone. The news from France is very bad. And I grieve for the gallant French people who have fallen into this terrible misfortune. We shall defend our island. We shall fight on, unconquerable, until the curse of Hitler is lifted from the brow of men. As the fear of invasion grew, the men who were not already serving in the armed forces, particularly the young and the old, were now asked to form a new force. In the Yorkshire village of Thornton, the men of a home guard unit made their own uniquely comprehensive record of its formation and training. This film only came to light when the final surviving copy was found in a veteran's attic over 50 years later. Behind the regular army, we have more than a million of the local defense volunteers, or as they are much better called, the home guard. Should the invader come, there will be no placid lying down of the people in submission before him. 
It is a war of peoples and of causes. There are vast numbers who will render faithful service in this war, but whose names will never be known, whose deeds will never be recorded. This is a war of the unknown warrior. Our local chemist, he was asked to form a, a company in our area. Using uh, British Legion documents, they worked out who had served in World War I. And my father became the company commander. He hadn't talked about World War I, but obviously he'd kept the uniform from then. And he still had a Smith & Wesson 45 and a, a German automatic pistol. At one point, Rob Brown is even caught on film, aged nine, with his younger brother James, walking down a lane in the village. Much of the platoon's official business was conducted around the Brown family house. Two sergeants who were members of the Bradford City Circle thought that it would be a nice idea to record the activities of the Home Guard. So Sergeants Harold Whitehead and Sergeant Woodhouse must have approached my father and said, would it be all right if they filmed some of the Home Guard? And my father took it to heart. He thought it was a brilliant idea. And indeed, it eventually paid for the film stock. The Home Guard was expected to act as a secondary defense force in the event of an invasion. But after the chaos of Dunkirk, real weapons were scarce. So many of the volunteers had to train with wooden guns. The LDV was initially known as Look, Duck and Vanish because that was the idea if we were invaded. The Home Guard were not expected to fight. They were expected to report to the existing system what was going on because they know the area, they know the hiding places, they know the back streets. The barriers were not the rigid barriers that you'd find in a regular unit. They were friends. There was a significant difference in the way people treated one another. They were fellow residents of the local villages and uh, were just nice folk. After three months, the Thornton Home Guard were eventually sent real rifles, brought in especially from the United States. As far as the view of the war from the Home Guard point of view, this was it. We were going to be invaded. The fear of a German attack from the air was very real. Just weeks earlier in the defeat of Belgium and Holland, parachutists had been used to devastating effect. There were telephone calls as there had been a report of a German parachutist landing in our area. This was most exciting to the Home Guard because it was the expected arrival of the Germans by parachute. And so Thornton scanned, scoured, searched, concentrating mainly on a wood called Sunwood, which lies in the valley between the two villages. But nothing was found. In fact, it was paper falling out of the sky. We have an Avro factory at Eden where they were assembling some kind of aeroplane. The pilot must have gone to Harry Ramsden's, the well-known fish and chip shop, bought himself fish and chips to fly this plane from Leeds Bradford, Eden, to wherever it was that he was going. And on the way, he finished his fish and chips and threw the paper out of the cockpit. Mr. Whitehead, one of the makers of the film, ran a fire clay works, which includes blasting powder and fuse and that sort of thing. So they made dummy hand grenades with conventional fuses, a very small charge, covered in quite dry clay. And we would throw them in the garden, throw them into a, a holly bush, and they made the most gorgeous mess. Dust everywhere, a loud bang, the tree covered in dust. It was absolutely great for kids. By the end of the war, the members of the Thornton platoon had never actually confronted a German soldier. I'm not sure how far the war impinged directly on us. It became much more of a family than a military organization, uh, but it was 
deadly serious. Behind it all, the social, the occasional drinking, and the marches where they would sing rude songs and that sort of stuff. It came down to this is us looking after our families. And so the Home Guard was serious. Although the Home Guard never faced a Nazi invasion, by the end of the war, over 1,200 of its volunteers had lost their lives due to bombing raids. My father was proud of what went on. And when the big parade in Bradford Lister Park, he marched his company in front of the officer commanding, was handed a trophy, and then dropped the base of the trophy on the ground. After the war, in the office of the family business, which I later joined, there was a small drawer with reference cards of the names of all the members of the Home Guard. And he followed them until they died. I'm afraid those cards have now gone as we, we closed the mill and we had to clear it out and they were not saved. I wish they had been. If the Home Guard was a last line of defence, the front line was manned by the pilots of the Royal Air Force. Hitler knew he would have to defeat them before he could attempt an invasion. So throughout the summer of 1940, the biggest air battle in history raged in the skies above southern Britain. A doctor in Kent was able to film the action from the ground. From the start, the odds were stacked against the RAF. 1,200 pilots faced over 2,600 planes of the Luftwaffe. As we got the order to take off, and I climbed hurriedly into the cockpit of my machine, I felt an empty sensation of suspense in the pit of my stomach. For I knew that that morning I was to kill for the first time. We ran into them at 18,000 feet. 20 yellow nose measures made 109s, about 100 feet above us. Turned the gun button to fire and let go in a four second burst with full deflect. By the end of the battle, the RAF had lost almost 550 pilots but the Luftwaffe had over 2,500 aircrew killed. An army major stationed in Kent filmed the end of one German fighter and its captured pilot. Having lost the Battle of Britain, Hitler now ordered his air force to turn their attention to a new target. Britain's civilian population. All over the country, in Britain's major cities and towns, people prepared for the expected onslaught from the air. In Sheffield, an amateur filmmaker recorded their efforts. Little is known now about him, but his extraordinary film provides a unique insight into the wartime lives of the people of Sheffield. One of the biggest fears was that Hitler would use poison gas. So, like many other cities, Sheffield held special drills. Everyone had to take part, even schoolchildren. Now put your books down and get your gas masks out. Quietly. Take them carefully out of their boxes. No, no, Isabel, don't drag at it. You show her how to do it, Margaret, will you? Now they're all out, are they? Well, I want you to put them on and let's see if everyone can get it right this time. In the end, gas was never used. Instead, the German Air Force started a blitz of Britain's cities. It began in London. From the 7th of September 1940, Hitler's Luftwaffe bombed the capital almost continuously for the next 56 nights. In turn, almost all the major industrial cities of Britain were attacked. <laughs> 
On the nights of the 12th and 15th of December, it was the turn of the people of Sheffield. In the immediate aftermath, amateur filmmaker William Baker was out on the streets to record the damage. The old city centre was now in ruins. Walsh's department store, that had dominated Sheffield High Street since the 19th century, was completely gutted. And almost nothing remained of the Marples Hotel, where more than 70 people had been killed. Even Bramall Lane, home of Sheffield United Football Club, wasn't spared. But some of the worst damage was done in the residential districts. Palmer's Butchers in Wolstenholme Road took a direct hit. In all, 78,000 houses were damaged, 40,000 people homeless, 660 people killed. The BBC interviewed some of the survivors. We was all hungry and thirsty. I had the baby in my arms and was never off my feet the whole night. It kept giving me a turn when I heard him breathing. It is all right now. Look, as if it was made of cardboard. It was horribly alarming while it lasted, and I found myself longing to be in the open. Dawn broke the following morning, it was drizzling, and there was a mist over the town as men and women began to crawl out of their shelters to look for their friends and survey the ruins of their city. They could hardly recognize it. Hardly a building remained intact. Sid Pass was just nine at the time of the Blitz. His family home took a direct hit, but the bomb failed to explode. We'd learned that a bomb had dropped on Gloucester Street and my father's sister lived on Gloucester Street. So we were anxious to find out if the family were safe. So we walked down the road. There was a big hole in the center of the road. It was big enough to put a double-decker bus in. And I'm told that that was a 200-pound bomb. And it was a 200-pound bomb that had dropped on our house. So if it had made a hole as big as that, to get a bus in, well, we wouldn't have been here. The place my uncle lived was on the right, up, uh, close on the right-hand side. But the house at the bottom of there was flattened. And there was ARP men or soldiers, I don't know, digging for some people who were buried under there. And my father and my brother-in-law said, we will stop and help these, to get these people out. They were moving the rubble and the people were buried in the cellar. Uh, and I said to my father, can I stop and watch? <laughs> and he said, no, don't be ridiculous. In many parts of the city, gas, water and electricity were cut off for weeks, just as the worst winter weather set in. A couple of days later, my father and my brother-in-law went back into our own house. There was a hole in the wall. So my father and my brother-in-law walked through this hole into the cellar and the bomb was still lying there in the house. There was no stairs, the stairs had gone. The cellar steps nearly all had gone. So my brother-in-law climbed up the wall and into the bedroom. My father was standing astride the bomb and it was between his legs. And they were throwing things down and he was catching them. So bad was Sheffield's devastation that just a few weeks after the bombing, the filmmaker recorded a morale-boosting trip by the King and Queen. I remember my mother taking me. And that area was very badly bombed. I remember standing opposite there and watching the King and Queen walk up. I was just excited because I'd seen them. 
But I think to an adults, I think they appreciated the fact that they'd come. 134 of the Blitz victims were buried in a mass grave in a cemetery in Sheffield. But as a kid at that age, I don't think I took it very seriously, quite honest. I can't ever remember feeling afraid. I was confident we were going to win the war anyhow. I mean, the film said so. We were better than the Germans. We got better planes. We were braver. It seemed exciting to me. It was an exciting time to live. Until 1944. And by that point, my brother-in-law was in the Navy and had been in the Navy, I think, two or three years before he had his own children. He took me around with him. I could swim when I was four. I couldn't stand up in the water, but I could swim because he took me and taught me. So the relationship was very much like my brother, really. And we got a telegram to say he was missing, presumed dead. And it destroyed my sister that she got two young children and she was 23, I think, at the time. And she was completely destroyed. She locked herself in her bedroom for five days and never came out. And that made me realize what a terrible thing war it was. Until then, I never took it seriously, I don't think. And it changed my whole f attitude to it. And, and I felt how awful it was. And whenever I've, I've told this story to some school children, and I wanted them to realize it wasn't an adventure, really, it wasn't. I changed my whole attitude to it. It was, I felt, felt completely different about the war. And I have ever since thought, thought that war should never be. With so many men called up to fight, women were now asked to play their part too. More than 80,000 joined the Women's Land Army, known as Land Girls. 650,000 joined the armed services, in the Navy, the Air Force and the Army too. And with British industry at full stretch, Women also took the place of men in the thousands of peacetime factories that were converted to produce ammunition and weapons. By the end, over seven million women were engaged in some form of war work. In Glasgow, an amateur filmmaker recorded the new workers at the factory of H. Morris as they turned their hands to making guns for the first time. We are confident that the enemy will be beaten off and I will tell you why. Your character is the first reason for my complete confidence. We know that you will never flinch. These are dangerous days. Days when the fiber of our race will be put to a hard test. At times like these, there are bound to be a few faint-hearted people. Never listen to them. In Belfast, an extraordinary amateur film has only recently come to light. After its original filmmaker gave it away, it lay forgotten, unseen for over 60 years. I knew this footage existed because Sean's widow, my Aunt Joan, had told me about it. And she told me that Sean was really keen to get rid of it because it was too painful for them to watch. They just had lost so many of their friends who were in it. So when I heard that it had turned up, I was both excited to see it and just so saddened. An awful lot of those guys were going to die. This extraordinary film 
reveals one of the war's hidden stories. The brutal effects of combat stress inflicted on so many of the participants in the war's longest episode, the Battle of the Atlantic. It was shot on a camera that Sean's brother, DB, had acquired in the 1930s. Like many brothers, they borrowed each other's kit. Sean must have borrowed this camera in the summer of 1940. From the start of the war, in an effort to starve the British people into submission, Hitler ordered his submarines, U-boats, to create a blockade around Britain. The Allied command organized merchant ships into convoys to fight their way through to bring in desperately needed supplies of food and ammunition. The Battle of the Atlantic ran the full length of the war, involving thousands of ships and planes, tens of thousands of sailors, and a small band of British aircrew, the men of the RAF's Coastal Command. One such squadron was based in Belfast with 22 pilots. It was filmed by Herbie Edgar and Sean McNeil. 502 Squadron was like all the Coastal Command squadrons. There were eight of them in total, and all of them were seriously ill-equipped because they got the sorts of planes that should have been pensioned off. Their planes were falling out of the sky, and they really were seeing nasty things happen out in the Atlantic. At the start of the war, Coastal Command had only 171 serviceable aircraft to patrol the millions of square miles of the Atlantic. It had a particularly high casualty rate that caused untold stress on its members. My uncle Sean joined the RAF in 1938. So in fact, by the time war started, he'd already accrued something like 42 hours flying. And I suspect, bearing in mind his engineering background, he would have been even more distressed at the number of casualties that were caused by mechanical failure rather than by enemy action. Imagine trying to go out in a tiny little two-propeller plane through the winter in the kind of weather the North Atlantic can beat you. Conditions at the base were very primitive and the crews were expected to fly operations around the clock. The strain began to tell. One particular thing that I did hear from Sean's widow, Joan, was how upset he was about the sinking of the Arandora Star. Now, that set sail from British waters in July 1940. And on board were Italians who had tried to flee from Mussolini and they were being taken for safety to North America. And Sean was meant to be providing air cover. But we had these diddly little Avro Ansons. They couldn't fly for very long. So he followed them as far as he could and then he waggled his wings to say goodbye and flew back to base. Shortly after Sean left the area, a Nazi U-boat sank the Arandora Star, killing over 800 people. It was really a painful reminder of how ill-equipped they were to do their job. In the first 10 months of 1942 alone, 502 Squadron lost 37 aircraft and 77 crew members were killed. It was beginning to take a toll on everyone and I think it was taking a toll on Uncle Sean as well. After the war, there, there was nothing. There was no reunions. There was, it was sort of not mentioned, not talked about. Well, my mother would talk about my father taking sinnies and our comment was always we had to stop because we would play them back and we'd say oh there's so and so he's gone there were times when he wouldn't get out of bed and the people from the office would sort of say to my mum is he coming in she, I don't know I think there was one Christmas he burnt all the Christmas cards so that it did have an effect that probably was post-traumatic stress that he probably suffered from. Um, but in those days, you didn't really talk about things like that. 
When I was looking into my mother's war, I came across a letter that was written to her by Sean. Uh, it was written in August 1942. It basically said that he was called off active service, uh, and I was quite curious to know a bit more about that. He was sent to Blackpool, which had been issued with Blackburn Botha planes and nobody else wanted to touch them. They were underpowered, they had lousy visibility, they were laterally unstable, and according to the account of one ground crew mechanic, they had propellers that flew off midair. I mean, they were lethal. And yet, the instructors there were supposed to take trainees up in them. And it got to the point that Sean couldn't take it anymore. And he went and he saw his commanding officer and he said to him that he thought the planes were the wrong things to be used. And he said, I'm prepared to risk my neck going up in one of these, but I'm not sure I am prepared anymore to take trainees up in them. The commanding officer got all the other people to come in and basically said, you know, does anybody else feel like McNeil? And none of them were willing to put their hands up. That must have been a bit devastating. But I think he was principled. I think it didn't show lack of moral fiber. I think it showed somebody who was principled and thought he could make a small change. In order, as it were, to satisfy themselves that it was part of Sean rather than part of the situation, they then put him through a series of psychological and psychiatric tests enabling him ultimately to be officially taken off active service. The RAF eventually told Sean that he was suffering from an anxiety neurosis, extreme combat stress, and removed him from active flying. He was not alone. By the start of 1943, more than 2,500 other aircrew had suffered the same fate. The term lack of moral fibre was, was used to suggest that somebody was a coward. And I don't think anyone could imagine that Sean McNeil was a coward. I think he was brave in voicing what was patently obvious, which is they had the wrong aircraft for the job. It was almost easier to label him as a coward than to say he raised a valid point. After the war, when you could collect your medals, he had no desire to collect them. He felt that he didn't deserve them. Well, he was a very sensitive man, a compassionate man. And that's probably why he sort of felt that he could go up in the plane, sacrifice himself, but not anybody else. And I suppose the thing is, you've got all your friends that in that film that you had jolly good fun with, right? Well, you were lucky, you survived, they didn't. Next time, as the news from the front worsened, we featured two filmmakers who attempted to raise their neighbor's spirits, a naval officer who defied regulations and took his camera to sea. And as the war finally reached its bloody climax, some brave Channel Islanders who recorded the Nazi occupation. See that next Thursday night at nine. And stay with us now for the story of the Cockleshell Heroes, an elite band of 12 commandos who paved the way for D-Day, the most courageous raid of World War II, next. <laughs>